No wooden boats anymore. No wooden oars. No hardly brass oar locks. And nothing's disgusting as a fiberglass shell or carbon or graphite, whatever the hell. Why mourn your third person? Why mourn your infatuated, inconsequential, vaguely illegitimate, young rowing affair in a world of dull, sullen hulls restored by a t-shirt rag and a splash of old English dark cover? Gone, gone, and you, old man, I mean me, too old for this ugly new one. If forlorn for wooden boats, each named with a V for Vesper, forlorn for your pride of place in a pickup eight that slid from life like a river, bow! Take a stroke, roared Alan from the stern, and you turn the boat's nose from the dock and shore. Vim, a brown single, more plowhouse or manatee than racing shell, Manning, Kelly, and Alan dead, boathouse co-ed, but once Vim was yours. Rowing like mowing, British slang for other things, fish food today in life's churning wake. And so what? This is one of the poems that I promised John I'd read and I think may work, but we'll see. A Bride of Frankenstein a Bride of Frankenstein. This morning I woke up and gazed at another opaque, egg-white, gray sky. Egg-white as in cooked, gray as in what black people used to call white people, none of us truly either, properly or totally, and I realized we were all Brides of Frankenstein as in that joke of a movie, men and women equally feminized by the horror and glory of reality. Natural, God-given beauty, flowers, lakes, sunsets, and mountains. But besides my reading that our seven seas would become boiling sewers while I was still alive, I identified yesterday by name an extremely pretty Bulgarian actress in a realistic Italian TV series soaked with obligatos of backstabbing assassination by automobiles crunching human obstacles against stone walls or strong buildings, pistols fired by motorcycle passengers, machine guns with fashionably perforated barrels fired remorselessly by ragazzi pouring out of white vans, switchblades in bellies, a catamite in childhood, therefore a victim, dropping pellets of arsenic into the hot tea of a pedophile professor who believed the kid had grown up to reciprocate his love for him, Women likewise resorting to poison when not kitchen knives. The actress's name was Nelly Topalova, and I was moved by her beautiful sadness, pessimistic bravery, so stalwart about her betrayal and abandonment by an improbably highbrow mafia hitman on the run from his most recent employer eager to tie up by murder his kind of loose end. Pleased to learn Nellie's last work was in something connected to a Balkan, Bride of Fat Frankenstein. 
Amazed to see she was now over 60 and had lately run unsuccessfully to be deputy mayor of Sophia. All this made me mindful of the childhood infatuation I had for Le Elsa Lanchester, who I wanted to be my English grandmother and who starred as the man-made monstrosity's wife four years before I was born. That first uh, Bride of Frankenstein made in 1936. Oh, poor Taylor. You have a face of suffering, I swear to God. Patty will hold your hand. But, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, back to it, Ken. I loved Elsa's likewise fearless and wide-eyed apoplexy, her energetic and comforting pride, her insightful self-mockery. Frankenstein, of course, was penned by the abandoned wife of Percy Shelley. Why are you shaking your head? Is that for good or bad? I you don't know. The fall. The fall. Last night we saw the twilight sky of autumn tenderly blood red. The queens of, set of heaven sending all men their blessings. And the moon, my God, the moon, it sailed above the fogs and frogs of earth as if a sullen but impeccable silver melon. Animals complaining in the trees. There is no fool like a rock, of course, a very old one. An old rat, a poem called The Rat, an old rat is a paltry thing unless it drags the pallid pudginess of its hairless tail in muck and ink for smut, bears its disfiguring teeth, this titan among mice, despised cousin of touchy skunks, pedophile rabbits and squirrels, murderous weasels, this eternal denizen of life's insane, besotting shite house. I did it. Sex, death, and excrement, intoxicating infantile stuff, a rat's eyes wild with wet focus on the angel's scythe or bayonet. Malak halom, it hisses, spits, threatens to bite, and utters its rodent's life, its rodent life's ultimate prayer and imprecation. Not yet. Malak halom is Hebrew for the angel of death. I learned this from a Woody Allen movie. He threw, threw around a lot of things like that, and I had to look it up. I didn't ever didn't know. Swamp. How deftly hordes of alligators fertilize hauteur in self-pity in the bayous of the soul. Each reptile a file or tunnel unto itself, groovy, moving in, moving in unison, enfilade to belly womp, whistle, and slap the murk with fat, scaly tails. What reservoirs of gluttony are the monsters silent, slowly, blinking eyes? Goodbye, see you later, glub, 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 vanishing with faint rippling into water, crested with gilt pollen, while the wind weaves a message of aimless misery in green and golden grasses, the meaning of its invisible opacity. A fish leaping, a band of light dense with insects swirling and clinging to their instincts, cryptic geometries, whose whole point is the stasis of explosion and splash. The enigma of our vicissitudes Slime and the soul, the mind's offal, and its labyrinth of glass. 
This is the last one I wrote before the reading. Rootlessness without amnesia. Why hate someone for the guilt of ancestry? In the old black and white newsreel interludes at the movies, when the Wehrmacht's armored motorcade roared as if with the force of history into Belgrade, the Serbians stayed home. Too many relatives still on their bellies in swamplands or on barren hills and ridges firing old rifles at invaders in helmets the shape of that era's automobiles. We had a Chevy like that, a bald, brachycephalic dome of a roof, thunder thigh fenders, 1946. Don't ask me why, and I won't ask you. The partisans in Yugoslavia, like deer or dogs resisting traffic. But when the same parade rolled into Zagreb, Croatians stormed their boulevards and droves, waving tiny swastika flags and dangling vast banners from bal balconies and upper stories bed and living rooms, cheering and crying like Jack Kennedy three decades later, ich bin ein Berliner. So intense their desire to be Teutonized and included as white people, despite being Dalmatian. Ich bin ein Nemački. That means I am German. In Serbian, sort of, yeah. They cried like anyone wounded by twisted cares. I am a prisoner of my biases, on my stomach in muck like a rifler, or susceptible to death as a mosquito, the souls of my people flying up chim chimneys behind me, dogs stronger than men, women, and of course children, tearing with teeth the color of cheese at my trousers, barking my rattled, exhausted, witless self, stained for eternity by noise, silence, and shame. My sympathies, therefore, lie with the deer, charging life's unintelligible highway, blinded and paralyzed by light at over a mile a minute, and by life's dark. Okay, neither a fellow traveler nor forest dweller. Why blame the guy hurrying home after a beer? Or poor snobs grasping at hope? All right, this is how I shortened Aldo Moro into uh, a little poem that might make sense, simply because it's little. I think that makes sense. Moro v. Revisited. Beware the Ides, my Caesar, of time's march, cried a soothsaying street beggar that distant afternoon in Rome, which echoed in hearts pounding with garden variety terror for two millennia, thanks to magisterial coaxing from the people's priests, poets and parasites, such as your professor Nu, G-N-U, or Wildebeest, and thanks to that flattering mirage, the mind in common pain projects on heroic, brilliant, or gloomily luminous martyrs and mirrors. Jesus Christ hung in the sun as if testing the sky for weather. Julius Caesar mumbling under the onslaught of kitchen knives and swords. A two, a two. Beware the Ides of March, the tides of life, Aldo Moro, two millennia, and but one day later, March 16, 1978. But as for the Jew's former glory boy, assassin, adulterer, poet, warrior, and king, squeezing for himself and his people some extra daylight out of pitiful, horrified Tamara, a girl. You can't get away with that kind of crap anymore today, except maybe in Syria 
in places like that. What can I say? It was the rabbi's idea. The wild mind of the kid who'd killed Goliath with his goatskin sling and the pebble long gone, flown far away. You know the story? They put Tamar in bed with King David when he was dying. Uh, nothing happened. Uh, he was too old and he didn't know what was going on probably. Uh, trying to bring him back to life. Okay, uh, Gimini. This is the dirtiest of the poems. I don't know if I want to, uh, but it has a German word in it. And, I, and, and Mike is here, so I'll... Uh, uh, the Crown of a Thousand Thorns. Between the women and the men, basically doomed Jews, plus psych physically, nationally, racially, or psychologically deemed deviant or defective, being here at all a stigma and self-fulfilling prophecy, like poverty anywhere of any extreme kind, there arose two rows of 10 foot high barbed wire fencing, creating a barren pail of packed mud and straggling, starving weeds, like rotten teeth and gums, the loggers being flaming, suffocating holes for swallowing life. This taunting, no trespassing zone attracted counterpart doomed superfluous women, now lanky, soiled and ugly, crazed in mind, sick in body, but afflicted with insane pity. So they'd come stumbling, stand and tear off their clothing, so gazing male equivalents, likewise piteously infirm, dazed and crazed to gutters of blurred, stuttering consciousness, would get erections, as men do when dead, and jack off, as they did anyway in captivity. Yank off, Yankel being Jewish for Jack, all except those with a foot in their graves, who maintained their gravity, their mental fortresses of piety, prayer, and dull perusal, due to death and the psyche's proximity. While the fools, the Narisha, wept and laughed, reality replaced as in life, by a phase of natural hysteria, like the white line of the horizon which precedes sunrise, with a punch in the face, body and brain, by the bitter filth of reality. I read this in a book when I was 11, in fifth or sixth grade. Otherwise, it's all in my head. We're getting close to the end. What time is it, by the way? I, I didn't bring my watch. 6.30. Oh. Rhododendron. Jesus, I don't know. How about news from our oracles? Uh, news from our oracles. The unbelievable is true. Our sewers, the swollen oceans, sailed by Noah and those busily copulating animals rocking the ark. Give it a rest, roared the sulking lions to the elephants. Maloney, mumbled the pachyderms to each other. So far, so good. Likewise, Vikings, America... <laughs> That's a skeptical expression you have on your face, uh, Der Simonian. Yeah, all right. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, uh, Baloney mumbled the pachyderms to each other. So far, so good. Likewise, Vikings, Amerigo Vespucci, Columbus five times, and God knows determined Irishmen in woven basket boats. They're slowly, slowly coming to a poisonous, demonic, vaguely womanly, mercurial percolation and boil. Tant pee. For me and thee, ragazzi, tant pi, 
Besides the fact that journalists are earnest, righteous, sometimes they're mendacious squid, squirting infinite clouds of ink into life's sea, of vulnerable, vulnerable brine, of rippled wrath and rapidly vanishing froth. Egg yolks will kill us. No, they won't. Yes, they will. Earth is a third cousin of the sun. That vast astonishment of dense gas, flaming dung, and wild-eyed combustion, as Earth periodically herself attests, erupting in rivers of its heart's orange, incinerating sludge, then ash, then onyx fudge. O oh, Mother Earth, our hamlet, we dwell on thee diverse as ants, swart, albino, or a fire, in the delicate miscellany of your verdure. Only briefly, sadly maniacal as Shakespeare's Prince Hamlet, obedient to a ghost patriarchy urging him to suicidal murder, only Hamlet's grandmother could have saved him, or me, or us. She doesn't appear. So are we doomed? Of course, though we are lovely and alive, perhaps the tips of our mountains will survive our swirls of swill. Our memory, if intact, on mind, Boy, I'm back to kicking the can, which I read already. I, I think uh, uh, we are uh, over and out. So as soon as Rick goes, I'll read you one last poem. It's called Rhododendron about a junco. And then we're done. How's that? It pleases me to see a black sparrow with a white belly skitter in the shadow of my nod and battered backyard rhododendron, struggling since purchased, planted, and replanted five years ago from a locally notorious joke of a salvage and surplus store. Martin's rhymes with Broadway gardens, proving nothing. Back to the junko. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, back to the junko, that tiny acrobat busily scurrying to feed on fallen seeds and drowsy bugs in cold and heat year-round, the advantage of its white belly slowly dawning. The bugs it grubs confuse it with safety, and the sky, 50 years earlier and older, warm-hearted colleague of mine in biology, died arbitrarily, I felt, of leukemia. I must have been 28. One autumn day before all that, we were out on the grass behind our offices. I probably for a smoke, him for a chat. And suddenly he picked up a stiffening junco that must have broken its neck on a window. I asked George if there was anything we could do and he, mildly surprised, explained gently, no, there wasn't, and slowly turned my attention to the equisetum stalks, horsetail, which grows wild all over Maine, noting how it dated from the Cambrian period. I must have nodded stupidly, so he kindly added, 250 million years ago. Good to know. Good to remember George, see a living little junko. Why complain about my paltry rhododendron? Why joke or complain? What do I know besides my being alive about a junko's advantage? That's it, gang. Thank you. I can't tell you how weak in the knees I was uh, uh, for this uh, 
performance. I can't imagine that I will ever read, uh, give a reading again. So I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, thank John and Kelly, uh, proprietors, and uh, thank the strangers, people who don't know me, and thank all of my friends uh, who came to uh, hear uh, Ken's uh, Ultima Paseo and Last Hurrah. Uh, Thank you. Any question? Huh? Did they name a ship after Aldo Moro? Oh yeah, they did. Yeah. And and didn't the guy get killed on that ship? It ran aground, yeah. Oh it ran aground, okay. Uh you know, there, there's uh if you ever watch MHZ on TV, there's a uh, Aldo Moro uh, dead in fifty five days. And uh I watched the first half of that and I found it just so upsetting. I couldn't uh, understand what was uh, so upsetting to me, but he was just so sweet and trusting and believed that the quality of sweetness that he brought to life made him uh, immune to uh, the, the terrible thing that happened to him uh, at the hands of uh, of zealots, uh, some of whom were deceived and, and some uh, paid uh, because of uh, uh, an unfortunate species of American hysteria, which we still have to contend with on a regular basis, uh, I would say. And I must have come to some kind of uh, remark like that when I included in the poem uh, the line, is there a lawyer in the house? <laughs> Uh, and uh, there's, in fact, there are more than one. In any case, uh, off we go. Uh, let's go get some wine and uh, stuff like that and um, call it a night, gang. Thank you all.